whether you're talking about the persecution of Christians that are taking place across Europe and across uh, the Asian countries, Africa, and America. Yes, America, as recently as this past Sunday. We are under attack. Not because so much of who we are, but who we are. You see, we are Jesus Christ's family. We are children of God. At the very moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we hoisted up a flag and said, whose side we're on. Now, you may choose to be quiet about it. You may choose not to step forward all the time. But I assure you, your enemy knows who you are. So we need to stand for our faith. And there are, when you look at the devastation, when you look at the trouble other Christians are facing around the world and right here in Texas, you might say to yourself, well, there are some places I'd just soon not be. Well, honestly, there are some things that you want to be separated from. You're not going to separate yourself from your faith. You're not going to separate yourself from who you belong to. You are God's child at this point once you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But there are some things that we should separate ourselves from. And let's see what the Bible says about it. We are separated. We are a separated people. But too often, I think, when people think of separation, they think of it in a very negative way. They tend to think of separation only in the terms of separated from. I'm, I'm not getting to have the things that I want or the things I value. The truth is, if you value your faith, you will be separated to a purpose. You'll be separated to God. You'll be separated to service. And that's very important. This book of Leviticus that we're starting to conduct a study in, and we'll be looking at roughly the first three chapters even now, it's easy to look at that book and say, well, that's dealing with the sacrifices and the things that are going place and, and uh, killing of animals and uh, burning of flour. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, understand this, first of all, that Leviticus answers a very important question. And that question is simply this. How are God's people to approach God and live in holiness and worship a holy God? Understand that? And holiness is not a bad thing. Holiness happens to be a good thing. We're going to talk about happy or holy as we look at Leviticus chapters 1, 2, and 3 very briefly. But understand happy should not be happy or holy. That's what the world does. We think the two things are separated. No, there is joy in serving Jesus. There is happiness in holiness. Because if you are separated unto God's service, there is a joy that comes with that. There is a happiness that can come into that play. We'll look at it in three ways. We'll look at the burnt offering. We'll look at the grain offering. And then finally, we're going to look at the peace offering. Now, before we go any further with this, and before people start flipping over to watch something else, let me explain something. Go back in time, if you will, to what it was like in elementary school. You remember elementary school? You looked at a blackboard, not a marker board, a blackboard. And the teacher probably had up above the blackboard letter examples of A, B, C. Maybe in your earliest grades, you didn't even get the lowercase ones, just the large capital letters. And our assignments would consist of trying to write the letter A, the letter B. On a good day, we were able to take on our names, things like that. It seems so basic in elementary when you look back at it, but then that's why they call it elementary school. You were learning how to get the letters down, Pat. And now you're an adult. And you don't focus on the letters, you focus on the words. And you, the grouping of the words, it becomes sentences. And you communicate a powerful message because you started by doing letters. That's what we're talking about in Leviticus. You see, the Hebrews were learning the letters of grace. They were learning what it meant to have this relationship with God, to take the walls down 
funny too because they're doing it in an environment where there's a separation between them and the Holy of Holies, a separation between them and the Spirit of God as sacrifices are made. They're getting the basics down. They're understanding these things. Now, by the time it gets to us here in the New Testament, we look at it and we're confused. Like, why are you obsessed with this? Why are you doing these things? Because for us, spiritually, those are letters of the alphabet being drawn. When what we are now blessed to be a part of are the sentences, the message of the gospel. So as, and I please stay with me on this, as you look at these offerings that are burnt offerings, grain offerings, peace offerings, understand that they are the letters of the grace of God that we know. And so let's take a look. The burnt offerings, Leviticus 1, 1 through 9. Always remember that God is as serious about sin as he is about restoring us. Sin separates us from God. Sin is abhorrent to God. He will not tolerate sin. We need to get into the mind of Christ, the mind of God. When we view sin, don't spend our days wondering how close we can get to it before we get in trouble. Keep the distance. You don't play with sin without getting burnt. Understand that. God is working over time trying to restore us, to bring us to him, to walk with him. Leviticus 1, 1 through 9. And the Lord called to Moses. Think about that. He could have called. He didn't even have to call anybody. He could have just spoken things into existence. And that would be enough. God can speak and it can happen. But he's given us a choice. We don't have to fall down on his feet. We don't have to worship him. We also don't have to know the blessings of God but he wants us to. And so he starts off by getting Moses involved for the benefit of the people to get involved, to become closer to him. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering is to be a burnt offering, sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Now we'll pause there for a moment because it's a good reminder for us. We're going into Thanksgiving. We're rolling into Christmas time. And as we do that, we're tempted to bring things to a church and make donations and try to help people who are struggling a little bit more. And that's fine. That's a wonderful thing. They need help. We need to be a part of that process. But do you grab the stuff that you don't care about because it's busted up and old and it's got water damage from the flood? Or do you find the things that are still in excellent condition and you want to touch another life with because you're really not using it? Or maybe you are and yet you're ready to make that sacrifice. Maybe it's something that values, that you look at with value and you realize somebody else it would be a blessing to. Be careful when we look for things to give away to those who are needy and poor to make sure that we're doing it with the right motive. We're not house cleaning. We're looking for an opportunity to be a blessing of God in that life. And when they were about to make an offering, a sacrifice unto God, they were to choose the best, the absolute best of what they had without spot, without blemish, to make this particular offering. And that's a good thing for this particular offering. You see in verse 4, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted from him to make an atonement for him. You see, the individual has sin in their life. They've come to recognize sin in their life. When are they going to be making this particular offering? When they have come to the reality. When they are looking at their lives the way God looks at their lives, and they realize, I have sinned and I want to get this thing right. I have violated God's law. It's putting up a wall between me and God. I don't want that anymore. I want to worship God. I want to be connected. So they acknowledge this, and it's interesting. It's not the priest who's taking the animal. It's not the priest doing this. The individual will take the animal, place their hand on the animal's head to identify that I am laying my sin on this animal because blood has to be shed 
and this is going to be an offering for my sin. The individual, not the priest, identified with the sin offering. And why not? Because if you think about it, it's not the priest who had committed the sin. The priest had already cleansed himself, sought God's face, went through a process of restoring themselves to walk with God just so they could do this assignment. And now the individual is the one who needs to identify and have their sins forgiven. Rolled forward, actually, is what's taking place because only Christ will be the perfect sin offering. So, verse 5, And he shall kill the bullock before the lords and the priests, before the Lord and the priests, Aaron's sons. Again, it's the individual that's doing this. It's not the priest. The individual will bring the animal. The individual will identify with the sacrifice by the laying on of hand and then will destroy the animal and will bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is by the door at the tabernacle of the congregation. You see, when you sin, there is a consequence and you are first involved in the process of restoring to coming back to God. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's important to understand. Jesus Christ is the first and perfect sin offering, the final sin offering. All these other offerings do nothing more than roll the sin forward. Forgiven for the space of a year. And other offerings have to be made. So we're seeking a permanent forgiveness from God because lambs and goats and steers can't do it. Only a sinless life, Jesus Christ, can do that. But we're looking at the sin offering right now, the burnt offering. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in the order upon the fire. And the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head, the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. There is preparation going into this entire process just to have the sacrifice correct. The person wanting forgiveness is the one who killed the sacrifice. The priest is the one who's applying the blood to the altar for forgiveness. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice and an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. By the way, I want to compare something now. You think, well, glad I'm not in the Old Testament. Listen to the New Testament, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Isn't it interesting? Let me talk about the fragrance that's taking place here. Because I think if we think about it at all, we get a wrong impression. Perhaps when you think of what it must have been like around the tabernacle, these animals being brought in for sacrifice to be put to death and brought in, and you probably think of more like somewhere between a zoo and a ranch where there's animals. I don't think that's the whole story. Otherwise, we wouldn't see phrases like a sweet-smelling savor. I think it's more like this. You know, Saturday I was out shopping and had to run in a store, and where I went was right across the street from a barbecue place. And they were grilling and barbecuing, and the aromas were filling the air, even in the parking lot. I mean, you got hungry just getting out of the car. You smelled the roasting of the meat and the burning of the fat. And it definitely smelled good, especially if you're shopping around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. But guess what? I think that's what we start to experience here. You see, it's not so much the aroma of farm animals. It's the aroma of what's being prepared on the fire. Remember, there's fat on the fire that's burning. It's the roasting of the meats. That's what we're hearing. Now, this particular offering, they're totally consumed. But... It's a sweet-smelling savor, not because it's barbecue time, but it is the fragrance of forgiveness. Do you realize that? It is the smell, it is the fragrance of a person seeking forgiveness of God. 
You are at a church service. This music has been fine. The sermon has brought you before the throne and an invitation is given and people walk forward because they're ready to deal with the sin in their life. They want God's forgiveness. And as they come forward, there's something sweet about that moment. There's something very powerful about that moment as people are forgiven of their sins and born into the kingdom. They become new, holy, cleansed, Forgiven is the word we love. That is the fragrance of forgiveness. And that's what they are experiencing there. That's why it is such an important moment. It is the forgiveness, the rolling forward of the sin. The next offering is also significant, the grain offering. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now, the grain offering followed the burnt offering after it had been accepted. You see, we had sin in our life, so we come forward, we bring the perfect offering, we slay the offering. By the way, it's the best offering we can do until Jesus Christ. So understand when I say a perfect offering, it's tempered with the fact that it's only rolling the sin forward. The one true perfect offering will be Jesus Christ. But I bring the animal, I sacrifice the animal, the priest lays it on the altar, the the blood is sprinkled, the animal is consumed in the fire. That is the burnt offering and it is accepted. And after it is accepted, something else comes into play, what we call the grain or meal or cereal offering. And I've now gotten forgiveness and so now I do an offering that is a way to dedicate something to God after this has happened. In verse 1 of chapter 2, and when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. By the way, that was rather pricely, but again, powerfully fragrant. Three types of grain offerings, by the way, a fine flour mixed with oil and frankincense. We just saw in verses 1 through 3. And then there are cakes made with fine flour mixed with oil and baked, Leviticus 2, 4 through 7. And then the third one, which is green heads of roasted grain mixed with oil and frankincense, Leviticus 2, 14 through 15. There's no getting around this, by the way. There are fragrances associated with forgiveness and the grace of God and a spirit that has changed. The attitude of the individual who perhaps was bitter before and not forgiving, now that they've been forgiven, there's a whole new attitude taking place. Verse 2, and he shall bring it unto Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, and with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. All the fragrances go up once again. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. They have to live. They have to eat. They're busy constantly going through this process of facilitating the forgiveness of the people of God. And so they need to live as well. And so these offerings coming forth that are being burned and consumed are also prepared and a portion will be their way of living, their food. In the same way that a person on a staff of a church, you bring your offerings in. Now let's make no mistake about it. When you bring the offering in, you're bringing it to God. When you lay your tithe down or your offering, it covers the expense, the operating of the church. It also covers sending missionaries out and, and taking care of our things. We might do a special missions offering. But also understand the staff have to live. They have to eat. And that's what was happening with the priests. They were allowed to eat of the meat of what was being offered. And the remnant of the meat offering will be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. In other words, they're not doing anything wrong is what the passage is saying. It's okay, it's been separated to this purpose. Remember, that is what holy means, to be separated to a specific purpose. And so this portion of it is separated to them being sustained. The offering was handed or entrusted to the priests. However, it was given to God by the giver. We understand that. Now let's remember something very important. The tithe is something we pay. We're just paying the bill, basically. God has given you 100% and you take 10% and pay it back to God, that's an expectation. The offerings that we give are above that 10%. And the best is what we choose to give. So 
you may give your tithe, which you should. You may give an offering above that, but you also, of your life, of your strength, of your character, you give that life back to God. You give the best that you've got and deliver that back to God. That's important. Consider Colossians 3, 23 through 24. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. In other words, with men, it might be an attitude going on. With men, it may be, well, they owe me something because I did this. But you're doing it to God. You're doing it because you owe everything to God. It's amazing that we struggle with how much we'll give in return for all that he's done for us. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. There is that powerful, that amazing, that absolutely incredible relationship that is so totally and completely different. Let's look at a third element, a third offering, if you will, the peace offering, Leviticus 3, 1 through 5. So remember what's represented here. The peace or fellowship between God, the person, the priest, and the families. Remember the first offering was strictly to get and to roll forward forgiveness for my sin. I'd roll it forward for another year. The second one was to express appreciation for it, to say I'd like to do sort of a testimony as, as what has happened. And this third one we're talking about, now this peace, sometimes called a fellowship offering, there's a reason it's referred to as a fellowship offering, is because this will involve God, the person who is bringing the offering, the priest that you would expect to be a part of the process, and the families of the individual. Now that's probably an offering you don't think of very often. So we got everybody involved, God, the priest, the individual, and their family. So let's look at what's going on. Now the offering itself consisted of bulls or lambs or goats, those animals, it's not just for a variety of, like a smorgasbord. No, the reason is those animals have different values financially. And an offering should be an offering that anybody can achieve. Whether you have tremendous wealth or whether you're going from paycheck to paycheck, you still want to be able to honor God. And that's what's going on here. Animals at different financial scales that could take place. Leviticus 3, 1 through 5. And if his oblation be a sacrifice, in other words, his giving of this gift, back to God, is a sacrifice of peace offering. If he offer it of the herd, then whether it be a male or a female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. So even this one, even though we've got varieties, you want to pick the best of the variety that you have available to you. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering. Again, you're personally involved in making this offering. And you kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now we get the priest involved. Aaron's son, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer up the peace offering of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It's going up before God. The fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that's upon the inwards. We're getting those aromas cranked up on the fire right now. And the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and which is by the flanks. By the way, get all this detail coming into play you got to realize God is in the details of what we do. It has to be done right. And the call above the liver, that's a, basically like a membrane that comes down, and that's how it's attached to the animal's body. And the kidneys, he's going to take that away. Why? It was a day and age in which they really didn't have a way of refrigeration, and the meat that's going to be prepared will be meat that they can sustain and actually consume. They're not going to mix it up with uh, parts of the body they're not comfortable about knowing that they won't be spreading disease. So Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that's on the fire. It's an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. It is the aroma of forgiveness. And in this case, it's the aroma of gratitude for the forgiveness that's been received. Isn't that amazing? Gratitude. Three types of peace offerings, a thanksgiving offering, a votive offering after extreme experience, and a free will offering of gratitude. Thanksgiving offerings are given because of just as the name implies, like we're going to have, as Thanksgiving time rolls around, a time to express our gratitude for the blessings of God in our life. The votive offering is you've gone through cancer and you were healed. You go through uh, a flood 
and you survive. Uh, your home is intact, or maybe you have to rebuild, but you are able to rebuild. You give an offering unto God that says, thank you for getting me through this. It was an extreme experience, but I'm alive, I'm well, my, my life is intact. And then there's a free will offering that is simply gratitude. I so love God, I just want to say thank you, Lord. That's the free will offering of a peace offering. So how does this connect to today? You say, well, I, I don't spend my days raising cattle in the backyard or in my apartment and then taking them out and slitting their throat and taking them into church. Well, guess what? The burnt offering, that first one, the one forgiveness. Remember, they were learning how to do letters. They were learning the basics. We look at it and we don't see the letters anymore. We brought them together into words. And we realized a blood sacrifice that can restore me after my sin is the burnt offering of Jesus Christ going to the cross, having been beaten and bruised and freely giving his life for mine. He shed his blood for you and for me. That's the burnt offering. And then from that we see not just the burnt offering, but we also see the grain offering. It's the resurrection. He came up out of the grave and we celebrate that fact. You see, with his coming up out of the grave, we follow him in believer's baptism. We celebrate that fact. We walk with him. We are restored with him and we're excited about that fact. And then we have this peace offering. So we have the blood of Jesus Christ that forgave us of all our sin. We follow him in believer's baptism because those that gladly received him were baptized. It's a testimony to tell the world this is what's happened. And then we have the peace offering, the Lord's Supper. We come together with our local church, a fellowship of believers. We take of the bread, we take of the juice to remember that he shed his body and shed his blood for us. That's what these three elements are. So the Old Testament, they were struggling to get the letters, to draw them just right. And as they saw the animals being sacrificed, they saw that there's a cost, a cost to sin. They saw there was a forgiveness of sin. They saw there was a reason to come together in fellowship. By the way, did I mention in that last offering, the family would come together, the priest would sit down with them, and they would come together and consume that as a meal of celebration and remembrance. Just like we come together as a body of believers in the local church who know him as Savior and Lord, and as often as we do this, we do it to remember him. That is the third element. So always think of holiness not as separation, but separation to God. Not separation from, but separation to. By being separated to God, we don't worry about having to leave things in this world that the world is enamored with because we're getting closer to Jesus Christ in the process, closer to the Heavenly Father in the process. That's why Charles Spurgeon said, holiness is the royal road to happiness. The death of sin is a life of joy. That's what you have in Christ. Three very special gifts. Offerings that we read about in Leviticus that you might have been tempted to think were boring or confusing. That's only because they were the letters. You've got the message of forgiveness. That sweet fragrance of forgiveness. And so understand as we continue to study in the book of Leviticus, as you read the book of Leviticus, put your Sherlock Holmes motive on. You can leave the pipe aside, but think of it in Sherlock Holmes who looked for the things that were elementary and then brought them together to find the answer. So as you read the passages of Leviticus, don't become confused or frustrated, but put the pieces together and find out the truth that God is trying to share with you. The powerful, powerful message of God's forgiveness to you and to me. So thank you, and remember that through Christ, you can succeed. God bless you.